What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? It is Maximus Keys once again back with a brand new episode of Genre Evolution. And yes, I know this is your favorite show ever on YouTube. On this episode of Genre Evolution, we're going to be speaking on Detroit culture and what Detroit has done to help contribute to the music industry. But before we start this video, I need everyone to like, subscribe, favorite, share this video with everybody that you know, and please do not hesitate to leave a comment down below after every video. I want to hear everybody's opinions and I want to hear everybody's views so that way we can keep this conversation going so without any further ado let's get to the video shall we the Detroit music scene has done a lot to contribute to the music industry the way that we know it today from the music the trends or even the brand new ways of writing music producing music and releasing music but in order for us to talk about how much Detroit has impacted the music scene we've got to go all the way back and start with Motown in order for us to get full context of what we're talking about Motown Records did a great job when working together as a cohesive unit from the musicians, songwriters, and even down to the focus groups who would tell a lot of their opinions if they liked the song or not and what could have been changed or what could have been left alone. And it was because of the label's musical genius within the music they would help break racial lines between blacks and whites globally. And by that time, Motown would officially be the soundtrack for integration. Artists from the 50s and 60s that would contribute to the Motown soundtrack would be artists like the Supremes, the Temptations, the Four Tops, the Marvelettes, and even the Miracles. The R&B Motown scene would help inspire elements between the new generation of rock artists in both America and Europe. The Beatles would even cover a classic track by the Marvelettes titled Postman off of their second record, and they would put the original songwriter's name on the record to show credit and acknowledgement towards the people that came before them who were involved in the Motown scene. James Jameson's bass guitar would even help inspire a young John Paul Jones who would be the bass guitarist of Led Zeppelin by the late 60s. I think a pure example of the inspiration that James Jameson had on John Paul Jones would have to be on Led Zeppelin's first record released in 1969, self-titled Led Zeppelin. One of the songs from that album that showcases the James Jameson style being played would have to be How Many More Times, which is the last track of the whole entire album. The Motown spirit will also help inspire groups from the mid to late 60s such as the MC5, Bob Seger System, and even the R&B doo-wop group called The Parliaments. The Parliaments story of how they became a part of the Detroit music scene is actually kind of interesting. Originally being from New Jersey, The Parliaments consisted of singers Calvin Simon, Ray Davis, Clarence Haskins, Grady Thomas, and the one and only George Clinton. All five of the guys would actually know each other from working at the barbershop. And in between certain hours, there would be young teenagers coming in and out of the barbershop just to hang out. Original Funkadelic bass guitarist Billy Bass Nelson was actually one of those kids who showed up and hung out at the barbershop. And even a young guitarist by the name of Eddie Hazel, who were all around the ages 13 and 14 at the time. Very soon, the Parliaments would arrange to take a trip to Detroit to audition for Motown. And eventually they would sign a five year contract with Motown, but not a single song was released or produced under the Motown label. They would head back to Jersey to work on their craft and get better at their art. And very soon after, they would go back to Detroit and George would sign another deal with the label by the name of Revelot Records, who were also from Detroit back in 1967. They would release their very first single titled I Wanna Testify, which would hit number three on the R&B music charts. And while building up their success, they realized that they needed a backing band right behind them to help them out with the music while they would tour and do shows. And the future band members that I mentioned earlier who were around the ages of 13 and 14 back in the early 60s were now older teenagers and were between the ages of 16 and 17 a young billy bass nelson and later on tiki fullwood on drums tall ross on rhythm guitar and lead guitarist eddie hazel they will all end up going on the road while still being in high school and one of the stops will be at the apollo theater but billy bass nelson will come up with the name funkadelic for the backing band in order to give the backing band some shine and in 1968, George Clinton would help put the band in the forefront, while the singers of the group, the Parliaments, would help out the band with vocals. The official roster of Funkadelic back in 1968 featured Eddie Hazel on lead guitar and vocals, Tall Ross on rhythm guitar, Billy Bass Nelson on bass guitar and lead vocals, Tiki Fullwood on drums, Mickey Atkins on organs and keyboards, and later on a young Bernie Worrell on organs and keyboards. And by 1970, the ages between the band members would range between 17 and 24. And they would mix hard rock, psychedelic rock, acid rock, R&B and soul, 
and funk to make early Funkadelic. And in the middle of that, they would come back to Detroit to sign a brand new deal with Westbound Records, another Detroit-based label. They would become peers with artists like the MC5, the Bob Seger System, the Stooges, and even Frigid Pink. George Clinton would even bring female singers to help make the sound more full. And the result of that would have to be Funkadelic's first album and many other records that would come out in the early 70s by Funkadelic. Throughout the early to mid 70s, George Clinton would continue to keep discovering new artists that would soon be a part of the P-Funk nation. And while Funkadelic would be officially established, she would help bring back the parliaments and shortening the name to Parliament. And even as Parliament, they would continue to be consistent with albums releasing every single year. Albums like Osmium, The Mothership Connection, and Up For The Downstroke would be prime examples. George Clinton was literally being a brand new Barry Gordy by not only just producing the records, but also helping arrange the band's music, helping bring new members into the band like Bootsy Collins and Catfish, and helping make new groups within the P-Funk Nation as well that will go on throughout the late 70s too. While P-Funk was dominating Detroit, both the MC5 and the Stooges were helping contribute to the early stages of proto-punk throughout the late 60s and early 70s. The MC5 were more accomplished musicians that would go towards the more political side when speaking on subject matters, while the Stooges would do the complete opposite not having the best musicianship skills compared to the MC5. The Stooges would contribute to the wattage and energy within the music, from Iggy Pop's dance moves, to David Alexander's heavy but steady bass guitar playing, to Scott Ashton's consistent drums, and Ron Ashton's headache fuzz guitar. Another group within the punk scene of the early 70s will be a band called Death, which featured three brothers, Bobby, Dennis, and David Hackney, who were also from Detroit. And at the time of the early 70s, they would play faster, harder, and louder than most bands at the time. And even though they didn't get discovered until the late 2000s, 2000s, their style resembled the later scenes of punk, which was more hardcore. And the artists that will resemble that sound will be artists like The Clash, The Sex Pistols, and even The Bad Brains, all thanks to the contribution of Detroit. Throughout the late 80s and early 90s, hip-hop culture would dominate the Detroit music scene. Artists like Awesome Dre, Merciless Amir, and even Detroit's Most Wanted would take over the 80s underground scene of hip-hop. While in the early 90s, an artist named Esham the Unholy would help contribute to the Detroit hip-hop scene on a whole new other level. Esham would take the practices of all the legends from the mid to late 80s while bringing shock value to the mix very similar to the Ghetto Boys. Esham by the late 80s would help contribute to a brand new subgenre of hip-hop titled Horrorcore. He would help up the ante by speaking about the streets, the devil, and the harsh realities growing up in Detroit. He also produced his own music and owned his own record label too. And in concerts, he would even show up in a coffin. He was even the first rapper to wear face paint to look like a psychotic clown on the record Homie Don't Play released in 1990. His contributions will help inspire artists such as the Insane Clown Posse, Tech 9 and every artist connected to the Juggalo community, and I'll even say Eminem as well due to the fact that a lot of his early raps featured a lot of horrorcore activity. Ishan would even help out the Insane Clown Posse with production on their first album titled Carnival of Carnage, which was released back on October 18th, 1992, under ICP's Detroit label, Psychopathic Records. And under Psychopathic Records, ICP would help discover many acts such as Twisted, The ROC, DJ Clay, Blaze Your Dead Homie, and even ABK, aka Anybody Killer. By the mid to late 90s, there would be brand new artists that would be cut from the Detroit cloth. Examples of that would be Jay Dilla, Eminem, Proof from D12, and even Royce to 5'9". As far as Eminem goes, there would be a clothing store that would open up back in 1993 called The Hip Hop Shop, which at the time would have cyphers, freestyles, and rap battles. Back in the mid to late 90s, one of the rappers that would come in to spit would be Eminem, and Eminem would showcase his love for the culture by being one of the best spitters in the hip hop shop. Royce the 5'9 even rapped at the hip hop shop, but after one of his attempts, he would get gonged out of the cypher circle. Proof was actually hosting the Cypher Circle, just a quick note. The Hip Hop Shop was the brand new place to be to showcase your love for hip hop culture in Detroit. Jay Dilla will also come out in that same era of hip hop as well. He was one third of the group Slum Village, but he started to really develop his own brand as a producer, being affiliated with the UMA, who was the production team connected to a tribe called Quest. Jay Dilla will help contribute to the new way of doing boom bap beats. For certain beats, he would have a consistent rhythm going while having a little bit of a lagging beat behind that rhythm. 
and sometimes his beats would go beyond hip hop. Some of his beats would be connected to R&B and the neo soul community, mixing old school samples with what he had with Slum Village and a tribe called Quest with the Uma, and would sometimes mix a little bit of live instrumentation with what he had in the Soul Aquarians. One of my favorite albums by him would have to be Donuts, which was released back in 2006, rest in peace. But hey, don't worry, hip hop was not the only thing that was dominating in Detroit amongst the 90s. There were brand new bands emerging from the ashes from the mid and late 90s, all from Detroit. The White Stripes, the Dirt Bombs, the Demolition Doll Rides, the Gories, and even the Strokes. The White Stripes would be the group that would lead the way towards mainstream success and they will also bring back the late 60s and early 70s vintage style punk rock while mixing elements of electric blues and they will contribute to another subgenre within music called punk blues. I think a great example that I advise everybody to look up is their cover of Death Letter Blues originally by Sunhouse. And what's very interesting about them, they would not have a bass guitar within the band. However, they understood that they needed a low section within the music. So Jack White would play a lot of the, of the low section on his guitar. And every now and then he would also play bass guitar for certain songs and live performances. And a lot of people will give Meg White some hate for her drumming, but come on, we got to admit that she was consistent on the drums. She probably wasn't the best technically, however, you can't say that she was off rhythm. In the late 90s and early 2000s, the White Stripes were pretty much like a new age version of the MC5 and the Stooges, mainly because of the rebel mentality within the music and the fact that they did not shy away from being themselves at any moment of their career. And my personal favorite album by the White Stripes would have to be their 2007 release, Icky Thump. To this day, we still have heavy hitters in the industry who come from Detroit. Within today's hip hop, we have an artist by the name of Boldy James who is one of the greatest lyricists of all time of this generation. And he is one of the many affiliates a part of the label slash collective Griselda Records. He's probably one of the most consistent members of the crew due to the fact that he always has more than one album coming out each year. And to make his magic, he always collabs with the producer by the name of The Alchemist, who I feel in my opinion has helped mold Boldy James' sound. Jack White is still making timeless music up to this day and even owns his own label slash record pressing plant, Third Man Records, which is where he sews into many artists that deserve to be shown. And the Motown music of Detroit will forever live to this day because even young folks and older folks are still listening to the music and the music will remain timeless. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I am glad that you made it to the end of the video. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, press the notification bell so that way you can get notified of new videos. Please share this video and leave your opinions in the comments down below. Let's keep the conversation going, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, thank you so much, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.